Good afternoon, sixth grade students. I'm sporting my um, uh, costume theater attire this afternoon, uh, Chewbacca. I uh, hope you've enjoyed some of the props and accessories and costumes that your collegiate leaders uh, have worn today. First day of spirit days. Tomorrow's sweatpants. Tuesday, anonymous blanks. Today we had costumes and props uh, sponsored by Ms. Stanton and Ms. Elevitz. We are on chapter nine of Granted, which is turning out to be a very interesting book, page 47. Page 47. Bicycle, Afia exclaimed as she came back to the office, finding Charlie sitting at her desk probably because his was way too messy and there was nowhere to put up his feet. What? Kasara Quinn, Ophia explained. Age 13, she wants a new bicycle. Actually, she probably wants a whole mess of things, but she wished for a new bicycle. She handed the paper with the assignment, her assignment over to him. He loosed a high shrill whistle. Wow, you actually got one. You're going out there. Where is it? Somewhere in Ohio, a little over 300 miles north. The sheet she'd been handed told her the essentials. Who wished and what for and where from and on what. It even told her why. Four talks flying time, Charlie calculated. Closer to three, Afia corrected. She was faster than him, after all. Charlie read over the sheet. Ophelia had already memorized the whole thing on her way down. The town center mall. Ophelia shrugged. Some outdoor shopping area. They've got a fountain, and the girl had a nickel. Apparently, her last bite got stolen. That's all that was in the wish. Oh, and she wants it to be purple. Ophia knew this because the great tree knew this, because when Kassara Quinn, the 13-year-old girl from Kettering, Ohio, made her wish, she gave specifics. Most people would just say, I wish I had a new bite. Not, I wish I had a new bite because some Ferk Bay stole my last one and make it purple. Kassara wasn't against adding details. Ophia pushed Charlie's feet off her desk and sat in the empty space. She noted the slight droop of his wing, the gray clouds in his eyes. Well, don't look so excited, she said. There were plenty of fairies Ophia suspected wouldn't be thrilled for her, either because it wasn't in their nature, Gordon scowls, or because they'd be jealous of the opportunity. But she expected Charlie, of all fairies, to support her. No, yeah, no, I am, he said, fumble tongue. It's just... Ophelia gave him a long, hard look. It's because it's lame, isn't it? A boring old bicycle? It's not that, Charlie said. It has nothing to do with the wish. The wish is... He chewed his lip for a moment, considering. It is what it is. We can't change it, even if we wanted to. Ophelia's fellow grantor and best friend scratched his crown of pink hair and took a long, deep breath. It's just... You've never been out there. He spit out finally. I've been out there plenty of times, Sophia said quickly. I was born out there, remember? Just like you. But you've never been out there, out there. Not like this, Charlie said. Not on assignment, not on your own. You don't know what you're getting into. That seemed pretty bold coming from a fairy who'd been stationed in, at a cubicle for so, for as long as Sophia had known him. Yes, yeah, she knew he'd been on assignment before. He'd shared stories of his grand adventures in the terror-filled wilds of human civilization, but it had been several seasons since Charlie Whistler had granted a wish. He spent most of his days pushing papers and making jokes and trying to cajole her into taking extra long coffee breaks. Obviously, he was worried for her, but she was plenty nervous enough without his anxious face in hers. Are you talking about the helicopters? because Squint already, already warned me about them. Charlie looked confused. Helicopters? Who said anything about helicopters? 
I'm talking about little kids with baseball bats trying to take a thwack at you. I'm talking about semi trucks with windshields as big as your house barreling at you at 70 miles an hour. I'm talking about grizzly bears. Grizzly bears. He pointed four times on the desk for emphasis, accidentally moving a pencil that she had perfectly placed next to her coffee cup. She put it back where it belonged. I'm pretty sure they don't have grizzly bears in Ohio, she said. Actually, she didn't know this for sure. They have plenty of black bears around the haven. You could sometimes hear them barking to each other all the way up in the treetops. They didn't pose a threat to her kind. Fairies would serve as little more than an appetite for them, as an appetizer for them. Foxes were much more dangerous. Alligators then, Charlie countered. Florida, Ophelia said, recalling her zoology. Siberian tigers. I'm going to go out on a limb and say, Siberia. Fine, wombats, he said, snapping his fingers. Australia, I think. Ophelia said after a hesitation, and I'm fairly certain they're vegetarian. But you don't know that for sure, Charlie countered. That's just what you read. Have you ever met one? Wombats are probably a lot more dangerous than you realize. Just listen to the name, Wombat. They probably ram into you like, like Wom, knocking you out of the sky and then swoop down to suck your blood. It was clear that Charlie had never seen a picture of a wombat. He'd probably slept through his zoology class. And anyway, Althea knew Charlie wasn't really worried about wombats. He was trying to fluster her for some reason, but Ophelia refused to be flustered, at least not by the possibility of blood-sucking marsupials. What's the big deal? I fly out, track the wish to this fountain, find the coin, Say the magic words in presto, because Sara Quinn's got a new set of wheels and I'm back here in the haven before bedtime. You make it sound so easy. That's because it is so easy. It's not, Charlie sighed. Trust me, it's not. Things get messy out there. Squint had said pretty much the same thing. Ophelia didn't know Charlie and Squint to agree on a whole lot. This wasn't the Charlie she was used to, the fairy who couldn't take anything seriously. Suddenly, so solemn. Afia tried to remember how many times he'd said he'd gone out, how many wishes he'd granted. A few dozen, maybe more? He was 10 seasons older than her, but he hadn't stepped foot outside the haven in all the time she'd known him. Maybe that was what had him spooked. It had been too long. He felt out of practice, didn't know what to expect either. Fia reached over and tried to tuck a disobedient tuft of pink hair behind his pointy ear. You know me. I don't do messy, she assured him. And it's sweet you worrying about me all of a sudden, but you're starting to annoy me. Sorry, he said. I just wish I could come with you. Be your wingman. Fia pointed to the top of the paper still in his hands except I don't see Charlie Rhododendron Whistler's name anywhere on that sheet of paper. Besides, this is my first assignment, a chance to prove myself to Squint and the rest of the guild to the rest of the Haven. You know how long I've been waiting for this. Charlie pouted at her. She arched one blue eyebrow back at him. But you can help me pick out what to wear. Let's continue on a little bit. Chapter 10, page 53. Of the 170 floors of Grant Tower, it's a very large tree, the vast majority were devoted to record keeping and general wish management, the basic bureaucracy of fairy life. Filled with clerical fa fairies who sat in spherical chambers with their wings spread or hunched over mahogany file cabinets double checking to make sure the grantors did their business by the books, at least a dozen of those floors were filled with actual log books stacked one upon another, tracing hundreds of years of wish granting from the moment a human first thought to make one. That very first wish was recorded down there somewhere, a man lost in a forest, aching to find his way back home, pulling up a stem of clover and hoping for a miracle before settling down to rest beneath a tree. Little did he know he was in the presence of a magical creature one of Ophelia's ancestors from eons ago, who took pity on the poor soul. The man woke to find a set of tracks leading him straight out of the forest to salvation. He kept the clover in his pocket, 
and fairies developed a reputation. Some might even call it an addiction for meddling in human affairs. Most of the tower was devoted to such history. Only the top 30 floors were dedicated to the actual tracking and granting of a given day's pick of wishes, including the guild head's office with its uncomfortable wooden chairs, the solar control room, and the operations center at the very top. Ophelia had been in most of them at one time or another. They held very little in the way of secrets anymore. Floors 140 to 145 were the exception. Those floors were home to the modders, a name they had given themselves, the most eclectic wrangled fairy folk you could hope to find in the Haven. A mixture of talented builders and makers and alchemists, they were responsible for the creation, maintenance, and repair of the gadgets and gear that every grantor took with her into the field. Everything from wish intensification goggles to underwater survival suits to wolf repellent, because wolves, unlike bears, were not above having a fairy for breakfast if they could catch one. They were genius, geniuses, the modders, not the wolves. Though you wouldn't know it by walking past their office, seeing them compete for who could sit on a spinning acorn top the longest without throwing up, or who could stuff the most blueberries into their mouth, six, which is impressive given the size of a fairy's cheeks. Still, when they stopped flitting around and put their minds to their work, the results were just short of magical. Some of it, in fact, was magical if only a touch. I'm going to stop there on page 55 and continue tomorrow. And uh, we'll finish up that chapter tomorrow, which is chapter 10. Hope you enjoyed today's uh, book. Excited to see what happens when she heads out to the human world. Have a good afternoon.